Let's start by answering the question, should you buy a house? Let's look at some of the pros and cons of home ownership, as well as situational details that should influence your decision. The first question that comes to my mind is how long do you plan to live in the area? If you're not planning to stay for more than a year or two, it probably makes more sense to rent. By the time you figure in closing costs of purchase, your down payment, any possible market value changes, and the costs associated with later selling a home, you're likely to lose money when reselling. Yes, property has been appreciating at record numbers for the last year or so, but I think that slowed significantly, and we may even see home values drop a bit in the near future. Now, if you're planning to stay in the area for more than a couple years, it absolutely makes sense to buy if you can. In my market, a 3-2, 1,500-square-foot house rents for about $2,195 a month. You'd need roughly $7,500 cash to be able to move into this home. First, last, security, application fee, utility deposit, etc., etc. A very similar home can be purchased for around $300,000 with a conventional loan and 20% down. Your payment would be under $1,800 a month. Although you'd need around $72,000 cash for a down payment and closing costs with this type of loan. This is at the rate of 5.25%. That same house with an FHA loan, which only requires 3.5% down, would have a payment of $2,300 a month. Your closing cost with down payment would be about $24,000 in that loan. There are also first-time homebuyer programs that offer down payment assistance to help reduce the amount of cash you need to purchase a home. When you pay rent, all that money goes to the landlord. You have nothing to show for it except for the fact that you weren't sleeping in your car. When you own a home, you build equity with every payment, and there's also some tax benefits to home ownership. Another thing you need to consider is maintenance and repairs. When you rent, typically all repairs and maintenance are the responsibility of the landlord. But when you own, that all falls on you. For example, if your AC quits working, you call the landlord and they send a repairman to take care of it, and they pay the bill. When it's your house, you have to choose and call the repairman. You have to pay the repair bill. Do you have money put aside for repairs after paying your mortgage and all your other expenses? You need to consider that in the equation because things do break and wear out. Now that you've determined that it makes sense to purchase a home, what's the next step? The next step is determining how much house you can afford. And unless you're independently wealthy, you're going to need a mortgage. Before you even talk to any mortgage lenders, though, you should know your credit score and what's in your credit report. Many credit cards will provide you with a free credit score. Check the website of your card to see. You can also get a free copy of your credit report from all three credit reporting agencies once per year. Go to annualcreditreport.com. I suggest doing this even if you aren't ready to buy it because sometimes things show up that need to be corrected and if you don't check your report, you don't know they're there. Now in most cases, a credit score of at least 620 is required for a conventional loan. You need to have a steady source of income. The lender will usually want to see at least two years of employment history and your tax returns. You need to know your debt to income ratio. Most lenders want to see a debt to income ratio of 45% or less. DTI is figured by dividing your total monthly debt by your total monthly income. For example, if you gross 500 a week, you multiply that by 52, which gives you $26,000. Then divide that by 12 to get your monthly income, or 2166 in this example. Next, you add up all your debt payments, estimated mortgage payment, credit card minimum payments, car loans, student loans, child support payments, etc. Don't include utility bills or groceries. We'll say $900 a month for this example. Divide total bills by the income. 900 divided by 2066 will give you a decimal result, which is your percentage of debt to income, 41.5% in our example. There's a few different ways mortgage lenders determine how much you can afford. There's the 35% 45% rule, which states your total debt payments shouldn't exceed 35% of your gross income or 45% of your net after tax income. For example, let's say your income is $10,000 before taxes and $8,000 after taxes. Multiply $10,000 by .35 to get $3,500. Then multiply $8,000 by .45 to get $3,600. Given this information, you can afford between $3,500 and $3,600 a month. There's a 28% rule which states you should spend 28% or less of your monthly gross income on your mortgage payment, not including other debts. Then there's a 25% after tax model, which is where I personally advise people to stay. This model states that your mortgage payment should be 25% or less of your post-tax income. Let's say you earn $5,000 after taxes. To calculate how much you can afford with the 25% post-tax model, multiply $5,000 by .25. Using this model, you can spend up to $1,250 on your monthly mortgage payment. This model gives you less money to spend as opposed to other mortgage calculation models, but it helps keep you from becoming house poor. There are lots of mortgage calculators online. 
to help you determine what your monthly payment would be with different down payments and home prices, different scenarios. Next, we'll talk about down payments and mortgage types. Depending on the type of mortgage loan you get, there are different down payment requirements. Let's start with a conventional loan. With a conventional loan, you need 20% down to avoid paying PMI or private mortgage insurance. PMI is an insurance that is added to your loan payment to cover the lender should you default on the loan. It can be removed at a future time after your loan principal falls below 80% of the home's value. Typically, you'll need to request this change. They won't do it automatically, and it will require an appraisal to verify that the value of the home is high enough to warrant removal. In our $300,000 house example, if you put just $1 less than 20% down, you'd have a PMI premium of $44 a month. If you only had 10% down payment, PMI would be $101 a month. And if you only had 5% down, which is pretty much the minimum for a conventional, PMI would be $155 a month. So you can see the benefits of avoiding PMI if you can. With an FHA loan, you can purchase with as little as 3.5% down, and you only need a 580 or better credit score typically. FHA requires mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. There's a 1.75% upfront premium, which is often financed into loan, as well as monthly payments. In our $300,000 example, the MIP is $205 a month. You cannot have this removed even after you fall below the 80%. The only way to have it is removed is by financing to a conventional loan. VA loans require zero down payment, but there's still closing costs involved, so you can't purchase a home without any money. There's also a VA funding fee, which is usually rolled into the loan. In our example, closing costs are still around $13,000. USDA is similar to VA in that it doesn't require a down payment either, but there is a guarantee fund, much like FHA's MIP, 1% upfront and 0.35% annually, or 87 a month in our example, and closing costs of $14,000. Ideally, the most cost-effective mortgage is a conventional loan with 20% down payment. You won't have to pay mortgage insurance or fight with your lender to get it removed later. Once you have determined your credit score, your income, and how much you can afford for down payment, and closing costs, and all that stuff, it's time to start talking to lenders and get pre-approved. How do you go about choosing the right lender for you? Well, in my opinion, referrals from your friends and family, people that have used them before, is a great way to find a lender. Another good way is to ask your realtor for recommendations, since they're frequently dealing with different lenders. They know who is easy to work with, who can help with some of the more challenging finance issues. I personally recommend working with a local mortgage broker. They are familiar with any market specific requirements that an online lender may not be aware of. They also tend to try just a little bit harder to make sure the financing goes through because they work with the same agents time and again and they don't want to jeopardize that business relationship. Pick two or three to work with and shop them against each other, comparing their offerings. Don't just compare the industry, but look at things such as what programs they have available for first-time home buyers, how do they communicate with you, can they explain all the costs involved and the benefits to choosing them. Once you've chosen your mortgage provider, it's time for the pre-approval. They'll need bank statements, W-2 forms, tax forms, and any other proof of income you may have, as well as a list of what your bills are in order to determine what you can qualify for. Pre-approval is different than pre-qualifying. Pre-qualifying is a quick calculation based on info provided by you without any verification or in-depth calculations. Pre-approval is where the lender goes through a verification process of the info you provided and it's a more solid number. Pre-approval is one of the most important steps in the home buying process. It lets you know how much home you can purchase and a good realtor will require you to be pre-approved before showing you any homes. There's no reason to show you a $500,000 house if you're only pre-approved for $350,000. It's also a security issue for the seller. An unqualified buyer may be a thief casing the house for later robbery. Next, you need to find a great real estate agent to work with. Now, while you can buy a house without having an agent, it's unwise in my opinion. An experienced agent can save you time and money by negotiating on your behalf, help narrow down your search in the MLS, and provide you with a list of other professionals, such as home inspectors, contractors, and handymen. An agent is also familiar with the market prices, and trends, as well as the fact that they see a lot of houses and may point out things that you might otherwise miss about the home, saving you time and the expense of getting into a contract and finding those things during the inspection process. You may think that you'll just call the listing agent in the home and have them work with you on the purchase. That's an option, but think of this. The listing agent signed the contract with the seller. It's their fiduciary duty to represent the seller's best interest. 
Do you think they'll negotiate a deal that is less than ideal for the seller? It's kind of like using the same attorney to represent both husband and wife in a divorce. Doesn't seem wise to me. You may also think that you can save the buyer's agent share of the commission on the home price if there's no buyer's agent. Generally, that's incorrect. The seller agreed to pay the listing brokerage X percent, and the listing agent agrees to share that with the buyer's agent's brokerage. If there's no buyer's agent, the listing brokerage gets the entire commission. Now, there are some occasions where the listing brokerage offers a discount on commission if they handle both sides of the transaction, but that's not the norm. You may decide you don't want to use an agent at all. You can go the for sale by owner route. You'll need to contact the seller and arrange to see the home. You'll need to negotiate a deal with the seller. You'll need to hire an attorney to draft a purchase contract or take a chance on finding a contract online and hope that it holds up if there's issues. You'll need to arrange for the inspections, then possibly negotiate again with the seller if there are items you wish to be repaired. You'll need to deal with your lender, the title company, and your attorney several times during the process. It takes a lot of your time, not to mention that FISBOs are a very small percentage of homes for sale. You'll be severely limiting your available homes if you go that route. So what's next in the process? House hunting. By this point, you know how much you're comfortable spending on a house, you have your financing lined up, and you found a real estate agent you trust to represent you. What's next? Well, it's time to start looking at homes. Woohoo! Talk with your agent about your needs and your wants in the house. You know, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, square feet, what neighborhood, how much land, what are your must-haves, and what are your desires? They'll start searching the MLS looking for homes that meet your criteria and typically set you up with a daily email of any new homes that fit the search. You'll look at the results and pick homes that interest you. Maybe even drive by to get a feel for the neighborhood first. When you've picked some homes that you're interested in touring, your agent will contact the listing agent and set up a time for you to tour the homes. All right, now you found a house that you really like. Now it's time to make an offer. You discuss your offer with your agent and they write it up. You sign it and they present it to the seller's agent along with your pre-approval letter letter or proof of funds, and any contingencies. The seller's agent presents the offer to the seller. They can then accept it as it is, counter offer, or reject it entirely. If they counter offer, you can accept or reject it. The counter offer may contain such things as a different price, different terms, or different contingencies. Once you have an agreed upon offer that all parties have signed, it becomes a purchase contract. At that time, you'll pay up an earnest money deposit, typically 1% of the purchase price in my market. This shows the seller that you're serious about buying the house, and if you back out of the sale after the contingency period is over, the seller may keep that money. You have a contract and paid the earnest money deposit. Now it's the inspection period. This is a negotiable time frame that is spelled out in the contract. In our current market, we've been offering around a five or seven day inspection window. Your agent will connect you with home inspectors to look at the house with a fine tooth comb. Once you get the inspection reports, you'll discuss with your agent if there are any items that you want the seller to repair or renegotiate the price in light of those items. Your agent will negotiate on your behalf. If the seller agrees, there will be an addendum to the contract spelling out the terms. If they don't agree, you can cancel the contract and get your deposit returned as long as you're within your inspection window. I'm in Florida. The process may be slightly different in other states. Now the last part, on to the closing. You've found a house you love, you've made an offer, put down a deposit, had the inspections and negotiated any repairs. Now what? Well, now you get with your lender and they go to work finalizing the terms of the financing in preparation of closing on the loan. They'll order an appraisal to make sure the home value is at least as much as the purchase price. They'll probably ask you for updated bank statements and other financial info at this time. A few days before closing, they'll provide a closing disclosure outlining all the terms of your financing, the APR, fees, your monthly payment. Please, please, please don't make any changes in your financial status until after the closing. Don't buy a car or anything on credit. Don't quit your job. Don't do anything that can jeopardize your mortgage approval. You will also need to secure a homeowner's insurance policy and possibly flood insurance before closing. In Florida, we use title companies to handle the paperwork of closing. They research the property to guarantee that clear title can be transferred and provide insurance to that effect. They will provide you with a statement a few days before you're scheduled to close, detailing how every penny is spent and distributed for the purchase. 
They will also provide you with instructions on how to wire the money for your down payment and other closing costs to them. The day before, or preferably the day of closing, you'll do a final walkthrough of the home with your agent. The purpose of this is to verify that the home is in the condition you expect it to be and that any repairs were completed to your satisfaction and that the seller has vacated the property. If things aren't as expected, you may need to delay the closing until they are taken care of. Once everything is cleared, financing, title, and your walkthrough, and the title company has received your down payment, you will have your closing. You'll go to the title company and sign a lot of papers. The seller will also have papers to sign, but they will typically not be there at the same time as you. Once all the paperwork is taken care of by both parties, you'll be given the keys to your new home. Congratulations, you're a homeowner. I hope you found this series helpful. Follow me for more real estate tips.